Hello and welcome to a, a, a special live streaming that I'm doing today with these two beautiful human beings. We're going to chat about uh, and a film project and that's happening across the world. We're actually going to ask for some financial support. So if you're uh, interested in this project, if it speaks to you, please donate to get this project up and running. Let me introduce Susan Stark Christensen. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Karen. And Michael Nay. Welcome, Michael. Hello. Let me tell you a little bit about these two human beings. I've got the bios here. So Susan, Susan Stark Christensen is an award-winning former journalist currently living in Alaska. She is the proud mother of two daughters and the grandmother of two incredible grandsons. And she's the author of Women's Voices, The Wisdom of the Grandmothers and producer and director of the documentary, The Wisdom of the Grandmothers. In addition to directing and producing Indigenous Prophecy Today, Susan recently authored the soon-to-be-published book, Flying with Wings. And what's your website, Susan? I haven't got it here. Uh, For Indigenous Prophecy Today, it's just indigenousprophecy.com. Indigenousprophecy.com. So this is the project that we're going to talk about today. And Michael is a filmmaker. And in 2011, he produced a short documentary called Peace Angels First Steps. Over the past three decades, Michael has successfully produced many creative projects, including documentaries, corporate videos, multimedia, CD-ROMs, websites and multimedia in theatre. And in 2019, he released a documentary about Crystal Waters Eco Village. There's lots of things we can talk about, but specifically we're here to talk to Susan about her project. Tell us about it, Susan. Uh, Well, do you mind if I just open up with a prayer? Oh, absolutely. It's kind of a tradition that, that I try to uphold. And this is a beautiful prayer that was gifted to me on my grandmother journey. Um, And it, calls in the directions. It's a loose translation of a Quechua prayer. So if you could just take a minute, everyone, to sort of get grounded and centered. And I'd like to offer this as a way to continue our discussion. To the winds of the South, great serpent, wrap your coils of light around us. Teach us to shed the past the way you shed your skin, to walk softly upon the earth. Teach us the beauty of your ways. To the winds of the West, Mother Sister Jaguar, protect our medicine space. Teach us the way of peace to live impeccably. Show us the way beyond death. To the winds of the North, hummingbird grandmothers and grandfathers, ancient ones, come and warm your hands by our fires. Whisper to us in the wind. We honor you who have come before us and you who will come after us, our children's children. To the winds of the east, great eagle, great condor, come to us from the place of the rising sun. Keep us under your wing. Show us the mountains we only dare to dream of. Teach us to fly wing to wing with the great spirit. Mother Earth, We've gathered together for the healing of all your children, the stone people, the plant people, the four-legged, the two-legged, the creepy crawlers, the finned, the furred, and the winged ones, all our relation. Father, son, grandmother, moon, to the star nations, great spirit, you who are known by a thousand names and you who are the unnameable one, thank you for bringing us together and allowing us to sing and dance the song of life. To the heart where it all comes together, help us to feel the presence of the creator within, to hear and to see the spark of life within all your creation. Gunachish Aho. So thank you for letting me say that prayer, Karen and Michael, and and to all your listeners, I would like to just take a moment to introduce myself in the traditional way. I have actually three names. Um, 
my first name comes from my mother's side and my mother comes from a Jewish background. So she gave me the, um, the Jewish name of Sarah or the, and that means princess. And I was adopted by a Clinkett elder. Clinkett is an indigenous tribe in Alaska by a wonderful elder by the name of Jim Walton. And he gave me the name Chaaksik, which means eagle daughter. And my Western name, of course, is being Susan. And so I come to the work that I've been doing for the last probably more than 15 years because of my work that I did with Jim Walton. Um, his clinket name is Klaak, and he was Kaguantan Wolf um, of the Eagle Moiety. And he talked all the time about spiritual unity between all the indigenous people. He dedicated his life to establishing spiritual unity of tribes gatherings. And he would talk to me all the time about a prophecy that I've since found exists throughout the world. And that prophecy says there won't be peace on earth until the voices of the grandmothers are heard. After Jim passed to the next world, I wanted to know more about that teaching. And so I listened to a dream that I had and I left my work in government and um, in my public relations business and all the things that I was doing that I thought was important. And I started traveling from the farthest north place on earth where Jim had gone and where he had worked in northern Siberia down to the tip of Argentina, the, almost the most southern place on earth. And I, I began asking grandmothers about what is it important? Why, is, why are the voices of grandmothers important? The north-south journey in indigenous culture represents the longest journey. And it's told that that journey is the journey from the head to the heart. And it's also the journey of the human being. So I went north-south and I started interviewing grandmothers, asking them about this teaching. And what I learned absolutely changed my life. I knew nothing about filmmaking when I set out. I didn't even know how to turn on the camera. Myself and two other women, uh, Siberian women, bought a camera at a, at a box store and figured out how to turn it on and just started traveling and meeting women along the way. And what I found is that Without a doubt, that prophecy or that teaching exists across every culture, every race, every place on the earth, and that the voices of the grandmothers are important for the world because what the grandmothers bring to the table is this divine feminine wisdom that needs to be brought forward in today's world and be more in balance to bring the world more in balance with the the masculine energy that's been out there. And that the grandmothers also bring a sense of connection and unity and unconditional love, qualities, a focus on community, qualities that are so essential for the world today. And that work led me to the work I'm doing now that, that Michael is, is so generously volunteered to help with. And for the since 2018, I've been interviewing indigenous elders about their stories and their prophecy stories and their what those mean for the world today. And so that's why I'm coming to Australia to learn more about what the Aboriginal people in Australia, we believe are critical to the bringing together of the unity of people and that the Aboriginal stories are essential for the world to know and that the voices of the Aboriginal people are critical to be heard at the table of humanity.
Yeah, absolutely. Oh, how beautiful. What an amazing project. <laughs> Makes me cry. You know, I, I had Stephen Strong on the show oh, last year, I think, and he corrected me when I called them the Aboriginal people, even though he's not Aboriginal, he's a white guy. But he said, you know, the, the word Aboriginal means not original. And so he calls them the original people. And I'm like, oh, wow. So ever since then, when I remember, I've been calling them the original people instead of the Aboriginal people because they are the original people. It's amazing, isn't it? But yes, yeah, so true, so <laughs> true. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's beautiful, and it's really the truth. So, Michael, <laughs> tell me about your part in all of this. Well, I get a call out of the blue from Alaska, and. There's Susan. <laughs> it was a bit of a surprise. The, the amazing thing is that I'd actually been doing a little bit of research about Hopi Indians and thinking about um, bringing their culture into another project that you mentioned, and uh, which I probably won't talk much about because that'll come later. Also, the Incas and Mayan culture, which Susan has visited, and I'd kind of put aside or, or forgotten about the Aborigines. <laughs> and it's like, ah, I get a knock on the head saying, you've forgotten the in Aborigines. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I've got to do this. And so it's a, an absolutely ridiculous logistical mountain that we're climbing <laughs> with a very short period of time trying to raise quite a lot of money because Susan and I aren't, what, what's the word? <laughs> Not flush, shall we say, and uh, or flush in the making, I should say. <laughs> you can probably talk about abundance lots, Karen. But uh, it's a very exciting thing, and I've always wanted to go to Ayers Rock, of course, and Uluru and uh, Kimberley's and explore all of that. It's just a really amazing, wonderful opportunity. And thanks, Susan. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Susan and I were having a bit of a chat before we came live. You know, we started the recording, came live. We were talking about running businesses in a more fire, you know, fourth dimensional, fifth dimensional manner instead of the, the old third dimensional, which is about charging people prices and competition and limited marketing, you know, get in quick for a limited time only because all the way that we do business is based in scarcity consciousness. And uh, we were talking about, you know, the new consciousness is abundance consciousness. And when you feel abundant, you do what you love knowing that, you know, the passion that you have for it, that energy flows and energy you know, it's all about law of attraction, isn't it? Energy will come to meet you when you align and uh, evoke the energy you're looking for. And in that, you know, like the, the new way to sort of do business is to offer what you have for free. And then if people align with what you're offering, you can ask, you know, for financial support. And that just gives people the freedom to give if they want to, if they if they have the funds or if they or if they don't have the funds, you can give a dollar, you can give $2, you can give $5 because it's something you're passionate about. Or if you have funds, you can give $100,000. You know, it just allows. It's just more allowing rather than saying, right, it's going to cost you this amount because then that puts a limitation on abundant flow, which can flow from anywhere. You know, money can come from anywhere and just open that up for that abundance to support your projects and what you're doing in the world. Uh, something that I've been living my life like that forever, <laughs> working for free for most of what I do and allowing the universe to support me. Susan, you wanted to say something. Support also comes uh, and is welcome in a variety of ways to the support of, of people to allow themselves to uh, pray for our project or send good energy or just to think about how important it is that the indigenous voices and, and original people's voices are heard. For me, that's a real passion. I, I often, when I introduce myself, and you've probably noticed this already, people always ask me if I'm nervous or if I'm crying. And I always say, no, this is the best I can get because I literally lost my ability to speak for over a year. Um, I had damage to my vocal cords and I couldn't speak at all. 
So I learned how important it is to be able and what a blessing it is to be, ha- be able to have a voice and to be able to voice our, our truth and our, our vision and our hope uh, for the world. And I, I think that original peoples all throughout the world have so much to contribute to the discussions and have been so left out so marginalized as have many groups been marginalized, but this timeline that we're in today and this time that we're living in is about connection and unity and oneness and hearing all of the gifts and seeing all the gifts that everyone has to bring to the table. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Yeah, we have to start walking the talk. We can't just talk about it anymore. It really has to be. We have to start evoking, actually living what we're talking about, which is the time, because the time for talk is over. (laughs) It's now starting to live. So what has been some of the messages from the grandmothers? What have they been saying to you and to humanity? Thank you for asking that. I think that's a really important question. You know, if, if you look at how older women and grandmothers are treated in many cultures, they have become invisible and they, and often they're doing what they're doing in their communities and giving and giving and giving and giving. And the way we treat grandmothers is the way that we treat our mother earth. We've been taking and taking and taking and taking and mother earth is weary of that. Our, our Mother Earth is asking for us to recognize her and to honor her and to um, understand that we can't live without what she is giving us. And so one of the biggest messages that I've gotten from the grandmothers around the world has been about respect, um, learning to respect one another and learning to respect our environment you know, the earth and, and all the cosmos, everything, we're part of it. We're not in control of it. We're a part of it. And that's an important message. And another message that is loud and clear from the grandmothers is we've been led by our heads for a very long time. The patriarchal system that has been built has been one that has been more around what we think, the head. But we have missed a key component of communication of life, and that's, that's leading from our heart. And that heart space is what the earth and what the time we're living in is calling us to do. I did spend quite a bit of time with the Mayan Council of Elders. One of the people that I interviewed for this project is the head of the Mayan Council of Elders, Tata Ernesto Campos. And there was a lot of talk at the end of the 2000s about the Mayan calendar ending, and there were a lot of fear around that. You might remember that. And this was just the end of a cycle of time. But we have come into a new cycle of time. And that cycle of time that we're living in now is, is calling us to change and transform and recreate ourselves as true human beings. Also the Hopi prophecies, I, I spent time and interviewed um, one of the, my favorite people in the world, a Hopi grandmother who took me to their prophecy rock. And that is a drawing, if you haven't seen it, it's a petroglyph, but it's a drawing that shares about the time we're living in and and the split that happens. And part of the message of that is that we must walk a simple path if we want to survive. We have to walk a very much more humble and much more simple path on the earth. So there's a lot I, I could, you know, I don't want to I'm sure Michael has something to say and you should say, but those are some of the messages that have come through. And I guess the last thing I wanted to say is there is a story that I wanted to share. I wrote myself a note to be sure and share this because a lot of people aren't aware of it. But when the United Nations was first formed, the 
indigenous tribal leaders across the United States went to what was called the House of Micah. That's uh, if you look at the United Nations building in New York, it's, it shines and shimmers like Micah. And in the prophecy, it talks about the, the House of Micah. And they went to the doors and they asked to be included. And um, they were barred from inclusion um, by the United States and other countries. And if you look at the way the United Nations is set up in their consultative chamber, it's a horseshoe. It, it, there's a, a podium and then there's kind of a horseshoe of nations. But the true prophecies talk about the circle of nations. And they knew then when um, they were turned away that that the United Nations itself was not going to fulfill, be the fulfillment of this prophecy because people were left out and the circle wasn't complete. And so I think that's part of a really important thing for people to realize that what we're doing now and we're doing it by ourselves, we're doing it with these kinds of talks with the kind of work that Michael's doing with what you're doing, what I'm doing, what people are doing all over the world is to come together in what the Lakota prophet talked about a hoop of many hoops. Uh And that's, that's what we're doing today. Completing the circle. Wow. Wow. That really hit me. That really hit me. But just, wow how they can be left out yeah completing the circle bringing humanity together in all its in all its beauty and guises wow wow that really hit me michael have you got anything you'd like to add what i'm finding is we seem to have forgotten how we've been connected with our galactic family and that is such an incredible story and such a rich story. And with the Aborigines and that entire culture starting so long ago, like probably the first cultures on earth and their stories coming out. And like, for me personally, it's just going to be wonderful to hear about the seven sisters and, how they see their creation myths coming about. And I think Susan probably can talk even more to to exactly that. I mean, that's really the basis of what I'm calling my section of uh, doing the documentary, which is kind of a little bit separate to Susan's. And uh, like ancient star nation connections is really like a chapter heading in a longer documentary. Over time, I'll just be continuing with the crowdfunding uh, with each new chapter as it comes along. The the whole picture will emerge of all of that. Susan, do you want to add anything about the Seven Sisters in particular? Well, actually, um, I don't because it isn't my story to tell. Um, It does in one of the one of the challenges of the work that I've been gifted to do is that um, the story in indigenous cultures across most of the world, um, their symbols are owned by the tribe or the stories are owned by the tribe. And so while we've been invited to come and participate with Susan Thompson and people up in Northern Australia, what we ultimately learn it, and what they ultimately decide they will, are willing to share with us is totally theirs. They own those stories. And I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to tell the story of another, of another group or another people without their permission. But what I do know is that when I traveled in California and I uh, worked with um, a beautiful Chumash elder there by the name of Ed. Adelina Alva Padilla. She's one of the grandmothers featured in the wisdom of the grandmothers. And people can watch that online on YouTube. It's all over for free. But Adelina was one of the special grandmothers that I got to meet. And what I was so fascinated by the fact that in the Chumash territory, there are 
seven mountains that are called the seven sisters. And they believe that these mountains connect to various points in the sky. And when I was in Japan, uh, I had the opportunity to interview um, two amazing Japanese elders who are peace activists. And they took us into a cave that they are the custodians of. And that cave is called the Cave of Mother Earth. And inside of the cave, there's a, just, it looks like a pregnant woman. I, you crawl down through all kinds of caves. I thought I was going to die and never make it out of there, but it was an incredible experience. And again, you see these places all over the earth where the same story about our origins and about our connections are being told. I've waited two years, a little over two years. I was originally coming to Australia. The day that Qantas closed down its flights <laughs> was the day I was supposed to fly out to come to Australia originally. But so much has happened in these last two years. And I think that, you know, everything happens when it's supposed to. But I knew that no matter what, no matter how long I had to wait, even if ever, I couldn't tell the story that I was called to tell without the Aboriginal people of, or the original people of Australia <laughs> being a part of that story, because yeah. it is such an ancient culture and it is so important, the stories, the lessons, the history that, um, and whatever is shared with the rest of the world, I know will have an incredible impact. Yeah. You know, yeah. One thing that we can mention is uh, what is planned is to interview a 93 year old Aboriginal elder who is the keeper of the story of the Seven Sisters. Is that still happening? She's one of there are a number of people who are, you know, as as you probably know, with your own history of different mobs, the, the story represents it's represented by a number of, of people. But we have an opportunity to interview um, an elder and, and that's a real blessing for us so we're really looking forward to that opportunity yeah as well as seeing all of the rock art of petroglyphs and uh, that's going to be fascinating look it sounds like an amazing project and as i listen to you talk about the seven sisters i'm thinking about the seven sisters of the pallades isn't there seven sisters of the pallades and how the uh, original the indigenous australians always talk about the star nation people and they and they say that they you know come from the pallades and uh, I, I once years ago when i started my ascension well sort of tuning into this conversation about ascension i heard that uluru there's rock or as it's called in the mainstream uluru is a big like crystal and it, it sort of pulses and activates and over the years of um talking with people on the show I found little puzzle pieces that are fitting more into this story and uh, I heard uh, someone talk about that actually Uluru is a piece of the Pallades and the Olgas that are out there as well and it was taken when when earth was when earth was created and it was this molten rock that was forming it was seeded the consciousness was seeded through taking a piece of the the um, Pallades, a planet that was already conscious and slamming it into earth. And that is what is known as Uluru. And so we see this sort of big rock and it's just like the tiny end bit. But if you go into the earth, it goes right down into the earth, kind of like a big spear right into, the, yeah. So that was another puzzle piece that I heard. And, and it does actually pulse. I had somebody, uh, pulses with life. I had somebody on the show who talked about another planet that used to orbit Earth that was destroyed many millions of years ago and um, it was pushed out into the universe and exploded and became part of the, um, you know, those bits in the belt, what do you call that, on this planet where the was life and the, and the ETs took that life and put it on, on Earth and they put it in Australia. And because this, they knew this planet was going to, you know, finish, it was a small planet, and that's why our Indigenous 
fauna and flora like the animals, the kangaroos, the wallabies, the, the, the platypus. That's why we have animals in Australia that are nowhere else in the world that it actually came from this other planet. And, and I said, why did they put it them in Australia? And they said, because of Uluru, because the pulse of Uluru helped the animals feel more at home on this strange planet. And I went, oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. So they're stories I've heard and I've been privy to. I'm sure that the Indigenous elders know these stories and they're probably secret stories, but they're out there now because they've been, they've, they've come through interviewing so many people over the years, but they would have many stories like this about uh, the creation times. And But what I'm interested in, what we've been talking about on the show so lately is the prophecy, you know, moving, what timeline, what is the prophecy of the elders, the Indigenous elders of Earth? Because there are several probable timelines that everyone's talking about on different podcast shows, the solar flash and the ascension and the new Earth and the old Earth. And, you know, everyone's got, Susan, what have the elders been telling you? Oh, that's a really big question. Um, It is. It is. (laughs) Just in and a nutshell. I think, and I think, well, one of the gentlemen that I just interviewed recently who was just got back from Africa and he was inducted into the Kuyu tribe in Kenya at Mount Kenya. He lives on Mount Shasta, which is here in the United States in California, but he's been connected with the mountain in Kenya. And there are many places in the earth, and I've been to some of them, that have this incredible energy and they're, they're, they're connect, connect us to one another and to our origins. And one of the things that he was saying, um, his name is David Maria, that I found really fascinating was that the timelines are all collapsing. Um, The past and the present and the future have always been one. It's just that the way we've been taught is that they're separate. But in this age that we're living in, all of these things are coming together. They're all collapsing. More and more people are being made aware of past lives, things that they that have happened in the past and and more connected with what's happening in the future but right now the reason that these stories and prophecies are so important is that they all tell us as humanity we have a choice we will come together we will unite we will recognize ourselves as one human family we will bring unique gifts that we were given together The choice we have to make is whether we will do it out of an act of will or whether we will do it as a result of some calamities or catastrophes or things that force us to wake up and change. It's always been the hope of the grandmothers that because of the work that we do, that we can influence people to make the changes that need to be made out of an act of free will. And you probably know, Karen, you've mentioned business. It's so much easier to live our life simply if we've made it as a choice. It's so much easier to be able to trust at creation creator to provide for us if we're doing that because it's a choice of our own heart. Mm-hmm. And and we maybe had to go through difficulties, all many of us did, to get to, to that awakening or that awareness. But it is our hope that by talking about these things and sharing these things, that people will make the choice to live a spiritual life and to live more simply and live in harmony with one another and bring about peace in the world that has been foretold by all the great seers of all religions and all ages, and that will come back together as one humanity by choice, not as a result of destruction. Of disaster and destruction. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it gives me chills. I'm getting chills. <laughs> I put this on because it's getting cold here in, in Australia. We're moving, we're moving towards our winter. But yeah, okay. So the 
One timeline is that we bip along, sort of maintaining our separateness, you know, polarised points of views, fighting with each other, and then some catastrophe happens which forces us to come together or we start to choose a different way of living and more collaborative, more unified, more loving, peaceful way of living and that we ascend into a new experience without being forced to by a solar flash or, you know, so yeah, something like that. Yeah, makes sense, doesn't it? Just makes total sense. So what are we choosing? we've always had that choice. We've always been the creator and the stories all talk about we've always had a choice. On the Hopi Prophecy Rock, there's a point where these two, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it, a time when this, the lines separate and one goes up and it's kind of like a stairway. And on that stairway, there's stick figures. And my Western thinking, having just seen a flat picture of it was, oh, okay, well, that's ascending, right? Because we tend to think of a stairway. So people are going up, but that ends. But the other line, which only has one stick figure on it, that is goes around the bottom of the rock, and it actually continues around. Grandma Percy Ami, who I interviewed, said that that shows that the path that continues is a simple path. And there's a point where these two lines connect. And that's where kind of we're coming out of that time where people can go between one and the other. But there will be a time when that time of making the choice has passed. And we will either be on a time that, you know, something that ends or we will have made a choice to live a simple life and be in harmony with Mother Earth. And that will continue. And I believe that from my own experience and from my own heart that humanity will continue. I just hope that we do it with less pain and suffering than we see all around us today. Yeah. So what do you think a simple life looks like for many people? Oh, you're, you're asking great questions. To me, I was, I spent a time of my life where I thought I was important. Uh, I was a deputy director of communications for the office of the governor for a while. I had a big PR firm. I had the big house and, you know, the four bedrooms and the whole shebang. And I walked away from that because I realized that number one, for me personally, that wasn't the picture of happiness. Having done the things that the world told me was success, wasn't success within my own heart. And that in order to find my true purpose on the earth, I had to be willing to get out of that go, 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 do, do, do life and become more in touch with my own spirit and, and also with my environment. And I live in a one room cabin. I mean, I, I don't need a lot of things. And I think a lot of us in this last two years, we're learning that so many of the things we thought we had to have or that we needed, we really didn't need at all. And uh, we need to look at how we can live in harmony with, um, with the earth and with each other and more simply. And that means the whole world. It just doesn't mean the industrialized countries. It means the whole world. So I'll pass the feather. We, the grandmothers, we pass the feather. I'll pass the feather to Michael or Karen and, and I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I got the feather. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, simple life. I found myself four years ago in an eco village and um, this view is literally just across the road. Beautiful. Gorgeous yeah, rainbow. I mean, it, it's kind of very interesting trying to learn to live a simple life. Definitely uh, being in the city, everything's so much faster and the pressure and just the pressure begets pressure and being in the country, just everything slows down. It took me quite a while, like probably even six months to a year to actually really just settle down <laughs> you know and get get in tune with the, the flow of the seasons and all of that kind of thing I mean that that's part of it and 
yeah, you know, just tuning into Gaia uh, and um, the, the spirit of the planet, but also all of the usual kinds of things with energy use and all the conservation things that we need to be aware of. And But it's really a, a mindset as well, just not to overcomplicate things and not to... I suffer from this trying to do too much, <laughs> you know, just like one thing at a time kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I think that a simple life, uh, like there's a community here, uh, well, there's a few communities here that are like moving out of the cities and moving onto the land and growing their own vegetables and, and kind of going back to a simple life in that they're making more work for themselves because they have to produce what we find that we can just go and buy at the supermarket. They're producing them themselves and they're calling that simplicity. But I don't necessarily think that that's what simplicity is about. You know, I think that we can have our technology and we can have our cities and we can have our modern world and still and yet have a, a simpler life. And it's probably to do with our concept of success and striving and money and making money and being famous and all those third dimensional concepts that uh, we buy into because we feel separate from our source. We feel separate from the love within us. And so we strive for life to bring us this feeling of being appreciated, being famous, so having lots of money. You know, we look to the material world to feel good. And I think simplicity is, is like when you feel good because you know who you are, you cease all that, you stop all that. You stop trying to be successful and famous and all the things that you think it'll give you. But it doesn't mean that you stop your, cre your creativity. You can still come up with creativity, ways to improve this world. And, yeah, you can still be that creative artist of a modern world, I think. That's personally what I think. I agree with you in that. I, I think that there's many things that are yet to come that the young people and people will be manifesting in this world that will solve a lot of the problems that we currently face uh, right. once, we, once we start focusing on on solutions rather Absolutely. than competition yeah you know you've heard of the guy oh what's his name where's he from the netherlands ocean cleanup you know he inv he invented that a cleanup thing i follow him on youtube oh what's his name european yeah. i think he was 17 when he came up with the the plan and it's this um catching the plastics in the because when he sees the oceans he realizes that all the pollution in the oceans the plastics in the oceans are coming from the rivers and so he's putting this machine at the mouth of the rivers and catching the plastics before it moves into the ocean but yeah many you know there's a lot of solutions to come up with to clean up this world because yeah there's a lot of solutions but let's get back to the project because we're kind of off track <laughs> So again, asking people if you're thinking that the, the message from the grandmothers, the Indigenous or the original people of Australia adding their voice to the wisdom of the grandmothers and the prophecy, the Indigenous prophecy is something that you'd like to support. Uh, if you'd like to see this come into fruition and you can donate, that would be wonderful. Or if you know somebody that would uh, appreciate seeing this the voices of the grandmothers down under. I know that they have been showcased in documentaries before, and, and this is another one adding to the voices, but we can't have enough of it, really. We, we need the voices to come out all the time, voices to be heard. Yeah, you can donate. Meet the filmmakers, $150, a Zoom call with the Australian filmmakers, Michael Nay and Alaskan filmmaker Susan Cruz are talking about the project. So this is something you've got on offer, Michael? Yeah, well, I'm just opening this and literally it was born today, the, the uh, opening of the crowdfunding platform. And we're trying to work out a whole lot of interesting and informative educational kinds of things rather than just, you know, the DVD and the tote bag and the cup, you know, <laughs> which is the, the typical sort of thing. I'm talking to a whole lot of different people who will be offering their services as a collaborative kind of thing as well. Some very spiritual people and healers and different people like that. And also Megan here. Let's take a minute just to introduce her. She's also in the Crystal Waters Eco Village with me. Hello. I'm the author of this book, Moon Dream, a children's book. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy to offer readings to, to contribute. 
if there's any kids who'd like me to read them a bedtime story or adults <laughs> too. Adults seem to like it. <laughs> Cute. Um, it's the it's about a little girl who dreams of going to the moon. Um, so she goes up there and meets the the beings that live there and the man in the moon. And the hope is to to inspire children to follow their dreams, but also to make children more comfortable with spirituality and kind of introduce it to them when they're young. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of children who have experiences that they're not comfortable talking with about and their parents think they're crazy. Um, so yeah, just to make children feel, feel comfortable with all these new ideas to them. <laughs> Sounds beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you for offering that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for thanks, thanks for everything you guys have been talking about. I'm a bit overwhelmed listening to you guys <laughs> talk about all these things. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to talk about. We are um, we are in amazing times. There's amazing things happening on Earth, and most people are focusing on the drama, and they're all upset about you know seeing the um, corruption revealed. But if you're going to clean a dirty house, this is what the guides say to me, if you're going to clean a dirty house, you have to see the dirt. So as the light turns up on planet Earth, it's beautiful. It reveals, it reveals the distortion to the light and uh, it's been revealed massively over the last couple of years. Um, what has been hidden and covert is, is, is rising. But, you know, what has been hidden and covert is also uh, the Indigenous prophecies. So the stuff that's been hidden and covert and secretive is also, you know, stuff about how we're all psychic beings and we all have telepathic abilities and we can all astral travel and we're all seeded from the stars and all this stuff has been also hidden and convert and that's coming to the surface too as well as the as well as corruption and and uh, other people's negative or separative agendas coming to the surface so yeah we're in powerful times and um, and powerful voices need to be heard anything else you'd like to say Susan I was just going to echo that there's an Aleut elder in Alaska um, by the name of Ilarian Merkuliev, and he talks about when he was a child, his Aleut elders used to say there would be coming a time when the light and the darkness would rise at an equal rate, right. but then ultimately the light, you know, would overtake that. And I think we're seeing that now where there's so many wonderful things happening, so many unity, consciousness gatherings, and so many things all over the world, efforts, they're not necessarily out there in the in the mainstream media, but they're happening, where people are, are coming together and raising their consciousness. And, and that's the light. And then there's all these other horrible things that are happening as well. But I think for me, the most important message that the grandmothers have given me that I always want to give to the young people like Megan is a true deep seated knowledge that we will get through this and that we will and can build a better world and that our choices that we make now ourselves and within our own hearts are the very things that are going to be the building blocks for the beautiful uh, world that's been promised that we we are all going, I may not live to witness it, but but our children's children and the next seven generations will. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a message here from Vladi, who's one of the youngest person in my group. He's in his mid-20s. I met him when he was like about 21, I think, 2021. And he's saying much love to all of us. He's, he's actually in Germany. Much love to all of you. Thank you for this live stream. You're welcome, Vladdy. So yeah, it makes me cry thinking about it. <laughs> I'm very teary today. I think it's you, Susan. It's your energy. It's making me very teary. It's that, it's that heart-opening energy, you know, like we were talking about uh, the patriarchal being the intellect and the, and the working out and the and the the matriarchal being the heart heart opening energy. My 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 guides showed me um, some nuances of that when I was editing a video of somebody that I had had on the show who is a, a singer and and galactic singer and um, and she was very emotional. And as I was editing, I was in my mental, I was in my you know the intellect, the sort of work it out sort of masculine energy, I suppose if you want to, for a better word. And I was criticizing her going, gosh, she's a bit over the top, isn't she? And then my guides interrupted me and they said, okay, 
go back and listen to that part that you've just criticized again and listen with your heart instead of your head. Like get out of your head and listen with your heart. And I said, okay. So I went back and I listened to it and I just burst into tears at the beauty of what she was offering. You know, when I got out of the mental, when I got out of the critical mind and put myself in my heart, I was just like, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. And I, you know, I think that, that we, we all get trapped in that. We all get in our critical mind and we listen to things from that perspective instead of coming from that heart-centered place where we can listen with, a, with new ears, with different ears, and really feel what people are saying, feel the message instead of criticizing the message. As, as it, Like I see on YouTube, people who listen to my shows and they've got their opinions and they want to criticize and judge and they're listening with that sort of critical mind instead of that heart, listening with your heart, yeah, which is the wisdom of the grandmothers, right? <laughs> well, thank you, Karen, for that. I know that a lot of the people, um, when they come into our grandmother circle, we practice what we call sacred listening and heart sharing, and, and that's sharing from our heart and also listening as if the voice of the creator was speaking. And very often the first thing that happens is they start to cry because I think it's our soul and our beings that are suddenly recognized that this is, this is how it should be. This is what it feels like. And so I thank you for your heart sharing and for your sacred listening and for Michael and all of the people that are listening to this, we have a grandmother in our grandmother's circle that's in Bonn, Germany. And it's just so wonderful to hear that there's people all over the world. And we thank you for taking part in listening today. It just sounds like a wonderful expedition. $1 or $5 on spread the message. I'm just putting it out there. If someone would really like to support us, we're actually... Like I've set the crowdfunding campaign at $22,000, which kind of just covers the, the basics. We, we're still struggling to work out exactly how much petrol is going to cost, but it's something like five or $6,000. And, and we're not even sure whether that's the return trip. Thankfully, Megan's uh, contributing a lot with lending her van and whatever, but there's many other expenses to come along. And if someone wants to just cover the entire lot, we've actually got some investment possibilities too where a payback situation can arise. And people can email me at eaglespiritmedia at gmail.com and we can discuss all of that. But also somewhere in the crowdfunding campaign, I'll be uh, putting a link for a newsletter and the thing with the newsletter is once we get going on the road, we're going to be posting little uh, reports and little videos and things like that. And, and that'll be part of the offerings in the crowdfunding as well. So I'm yet to kind of really nail all that down. We want to actually include the outer world via social media on the journey with us and just get little snapshots of what's going on and meet various different people and make it as exciting as we possibly can. Wonderful, beautiful. Thank you for joining us today and thanks to everyone that's been watching the live stream. And I wanted to just say to Maria, who was tuning in before, she corrected me. She said it was called the Orion's Belt where the, or the particles of the planet. And I'm like, that's what, that's what it was called. It was called the Orion's Belt. But thanks, thanks for that information. And thank you, Susan and Michael, for joining me. And, yeah, please, please finish with the four directions. That would be beautiful. Thank you. To the winds of the south, great serpent, we thank you for wrapping your coils of light around us and teaching us to shed the past the way you shed your skin. We thank you for teaching us to walk softly on the earth and teaching us the beauty of your ways. To the winds of the west, mother, sister, jaguar, we thank you protecting our medicine space and teaching us to live the way of peace and to live impeccably and showing us the way beyond death. We thank you and we release you. To the winds of the North, hummingbird grandmothers and grandfathers, ancient ones, we thank you for warming your hands by our fires and whispering to us in the wind. We honor you who have come before us and you who will come after us, our children's children. We thank you and we release you. 
to the winds of the east, great eagle, great condor. We thank you for coming to us from the place of the rising sun and keeping us under your wing. We thank you for showing us the mountains we only dare to dream of and teaching us to fly wing to wing with the great spirit. We thank you, we release you. Mother Earth, we thank you for allowing us to gather together for the healing of all your children, the stone people, the plant people, the four-legged, the two-legged, the creepy crawlers, the fin, the furred, and the winged ones, all our relations. We thank you, we release you. Father, Son, Grandmother, Moon, to the star nations, great spirit, you who are known by a thousand names and you who are the unnameable one, we thank you for bringing us together and allowing us to sing and dance the song of life. We thank you, we release you. And to our hearts, where it all comes together, we thank you for helping us to feel the presence of the creator within, to see and to hear the spark of life within all your creation. Thank you. We release you. Gwinalchish aho, all my relations. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your project with us. And I hope that I hope that you get some financial support because I think that this sounds like an amazing project. And thank you so much, Karen, for doing this. It's wonderful. Thank I think you, you can Karen so much for what you do and for allowing us to share on your platform. Thank you. This is Warunga, who uh, quite often is around our area, and I've done a number of videos with him. That's a bull roarer. Anyway, thank you again, Karen. That's really great. And thanks, Susan, for coming all the way from Alaska. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to go up to Alaska. Thanks Anytime. again, guys. Thanks You're again, You're always guys. welcome, Karen. <laughs> well, dying one, I look forward to meeting you when you come out to Australia. Hopefully you'll, you'll probably have to land in, well, you might land in Brisbane. You could land in Sydney. But anyway, we'll meet one day. One day, one day. All right, guys. Big love. Bye. Thank you.